moderator for uh, this opportunity. I really want to join uh, my co-panelists in thanking the organizers of this Oxford University Conference uh, and giving us a platform to uh, put forward ideas that could help bring an end to this uh, senseless war. Uh, I want to associate myself with uh, the statements of my co-panelists uh, and thank them for really uh, stepping up and, and setting the stage for what I expect to be a very meaningful and fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, Professor Willis for her overview, which is very poignant and precise. Uh, Lord Boyteng for his global appeal that elected officials, members of parliaments across the world, uh, the way that the U.S. Senate has been seized uh, to enact legislation and uh, resolution 684. And Honorable Hoffman uh, for stepping forward and beginning to initiate some actions within the German parliament that can influence events within not just Germany, uh, but also the European Union. And of course, uh, Professor Gary for her leadership in trying to instill accountability and an end to the impunity that we now see in the conflict in Cameroon. I was asked to specifically address the role of the international community and notably including the United States with regards to the implementation of resolution 684. So I wouldn't belabor the points that have already been made by previous speakers and I'll go directly to the assignment that I was given. I would, however, preface my remarks with two points for the record. First is that the Norwegian Refugee Council that Professor Gary referred to for two years in a row has stated that the conflict that's currently taking place in former British Southern Cameroon is the most underreported conflict in the world for two years in a row. The Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugees Council, Jan Englund, is one of the most, the highest profile of personalities that had the courage to go visit the conflict zones. Many people have sat in their comfort zones in New York or Washington or, or in other capitals and have issued statements without taking the effort, without making the effort to go see for themselves the lives that are being lost and the destruction, the level of destruction that's being emitted on the people of former British Cameroon or what's commonly referred to in Cameroon today as the Northwest and Southwest regions of the country. The second point I want to bring to our attention is that the United Nation, the United States Holocaust Museum, highly reputable organization, has now classified Cameroon as one of the priority countries in its conflict prevention center, in its genocide prevention center, which is something that's a wake up call to all of us that an institution that specializes in tracking genocide and atrocities around the world is now so preoccupied with what is happening in Cameroon to be able to shortlist it as a country of concern and priority. So with those two ideas, let me get straight to the United Nations and I have three points to make with regards to the United Nations. The United Nations needs to step up and speak out. First of all, we are aware of the fact that the United Nations Security Council last year adopted resolution 2532, which was a resolution that called for a global ceasefire because of COVID-19 and basically encapsulated or captured a statement issued by the UN Secretary General himself. There is no doubt in anyone's mind that that resolution 2532 was not respected in Cameroon because some of the worst atrocities that we saw through 2020 happened right in the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic. As Africa, as the world really, bears to a second wave of COVID-19, which is certainly going to hit Africa and Cameroon in particular, we have to be sensitized to the fact that that resolution was not implemented and if we do not have an immediate ceasefire, that the impact of these atrocities or this conflict are going to be aggravated by the second wave of COVID-19. Secondly, I'll ask that the United Nations facilitate and contribute to put in place a delegation that can conduct a fact-finding mission. And the United Nations 
Human Rights Council may be the vehicle most appropriate for this. They have the necessity being driven by the fact that we do not have the data that we need or updated information on this crisis because of the blackout on the international media, the impossibility that international human rights organizations have to be able to access the country, let alone the conflict zones, confirms the fact that this uh, the conflict is being underreported. Everyone on this call will remember that since 2019, the official figures of deaths in, in this conflict have stayed miraculously at 3,000 deaths. Whereas we know that people are being killed on a daily basis, and that even since January 1, 2021, more than 60 people have already been killed as a result of this crisis. Yet on every official report that you see, there's reference to 3,000 deaths. So whether it's 1.1 million kids out of school, whether it's close to a million people that are internally displaced persons, or 70,000 that are refugees in Nigeria and other neighboring countries, the data on this crisis is underreported. And the one thing that can give everybody around the globe viable information to work with, it's a high level fact finding mission that will report its findings to the United Nations Security Council that can then be pushed to make resolutions, to adopt resolutions to make sure that this conflict can be brought to an end and that the atrocities and gross violations of human rights could also be brought to an end. Thirdly, United Nations agencies have to raise their voices. There are horrible things happening that fall within the jurisdiction of various United Nations agencies, and yet we're not seeing the sense of urgency that ought to be applied to this case. UNICEF, for example, when we talk about 1.1 million kids out of school, when we know that for five years, the kids that were 12, 13 years old are now becoming adults without a level of education that's going to help them in the future, then we know that we are condemning the next generation or multiple generations of English-speaking Cameroonians. The UNICEF ought to be shouting out on rooftops with regards to the plight of children caught up in this conflict and children of the former British Southern Cameroons. UN women, we're hearing about prostitution, young girls being exposed to prostitution and violence against women in the other regions in which they now live as internally displaced persons, detached and abandoned from their families that they can't find and reunite. UN women should be out there bringing people to highlight or highlighting the plight of women and children and young girls as a result of this conflict. WHO, we've heard about the burning of health facilities. A hospital was destroyed in Kumba, was burned down in Kumba last year or the year before. We've heard about armed groups or soldiers in uniform going to health facilities, allegedly looking for armed, uh, members of armed groups. This is unacceptable. This is a breach of international law, humanitarian law, and these are incidents that should be highlighted by UN agencies in order to bring more credibility to the reporting that we're seeing on the ground. Let me, in the remainder of my time, talk about the US administration. And as you all know, I do not work for the US government, so I cannot speak for the US government, but as someone based in Washington that observes how US policies are made and how US politics plays itself out, I would venture to make the following suggestions. One, with regards to the Biden administration, I think it started off in the right place. President Joe Biden made one of his first calls to the African Union to say the United States is back. The United States recognizes the role of the African Union, and the United States wants to work with the African Union and other regional organizations to make sure that the human rights of citizens are respected everywhere in the world. I'm paraphrasing, but it's almost in accord with regards to human rights and the violations that we now see in a country like Cameroon. I also would highlight the fact that the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, in his confirmation hearings, made specific reference to the conflict in Cameroon as one of the priority areas 
of concern for him as Secretary of State. And we hope that now that he's been confirmed, as he puts in place his team on Africa and on Cameroon, that he will be able to make sure that this conflict stays a priority for the State Department. I also would want to look around and see the people who are being brought into the Biden administration, many of whom are very conversant of the root causes of this crisis and the plight of people in the Northwest and the Southwest, and whom in their respective positions should do everything in their power to make sure that the crisis can be front and center and that we can galvanize the international support that's required to bring an end to this hostility. I'm thinking about the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, who is an Africanist, former Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, and very knowledgeable about the crisis, and recognizing the fact that a lot of things get resolved within the United Nations system. And if you have someone there who is conversant of the crisis, they should take on that responsibility to make sure that everyone else is well informed and that the international community can play a role bringing an end to this crisis. Joe Biden himself has a unique relationship with the US Congress because he was a senator uh, prior to becoming uh, the vice president for Barack Obama. And while in the Senate, was a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So he knows Africa well. He knows how to build alliances. And our hope is that he's going to be able to build these alliances to make sure that he can put his money where his mouth has been for the past three weeks. That then takes me to the second level of influence within Washington circles, which is the United States Congress. We are very fortunate to see that for the first time in American history, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee is an African-American congressman, Gregory Mix, who knows Africa and who is as seized with the challenges that the continent faces as many of us on this call are. Our hope is that the chairman is going to use his position of influence to make sure that the executive branch can get the resources that they need to be able to implement policies that will bring an end to this conflict, but also in the process of checks and balances to be able to hold the executive branch to deliver on the promise to contribute to meaningful peace in Cameroon. And the last point that I would say is that Congressman Mix, working with uh, the chair of the Africa Subcommittee in the person of Representative Karen Bass and many other well wishes should be able to make sure the Congress continues to desist with this issue. Of course, I couldn't end without talking about the US Senate and Resolution 684, because it was remarkable that despite the polarization that we now see in US politics, that the US Senate was able to come together in a bipartisan fashion to adopt this resolution on January 1, 2021. That we see promise within the US Senate that they're not going to stop at this that they're going to engage their bilateral partners, legislators in other countries. They're going to think through transforming the resolution into a bill and into a legislation that will have benchmarks and carrots and sticks to make sure that something could be done to bring an end to this senseless conflict. So in a nutshell, and to finish, I believe that the moment is right, that the context is appropriate, for all of us to redouble our efforts in advocacy, to build the kind of consensus that we need across the globe to help the people on the ground who for the past five years have had to live through killings, atrocities, death, and destruction, and who wish that their voices be heard, that the root causes of this conflict be addressed, and that they be able to live in peace. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to addressing any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, our 